My name is Per, I'm studying in the Loomis batch above you guys. Um, I'm somewhat experienced with debating because I'm currently the vice president of Lynn Debate Society, have been the European champion, world's finalist, so done quite a bit. Yay, um, awesome. Um, what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about why debating is cool and why you should learn it. And apparently some of you have similar ideas and would like to learn it and give you some structure. So we're having three sessions, all of 45 minutes with 15 minutes break in between. I'll do a bit lecture first, which we can record. Afterwards, we do a practice session all together where you can try to put into practice the one thing I hopefully managed to teach you or at least remind you. Uh, obviously, as an environment, there's no silver bullets in referees either, so what I can do is remind you of certain things which you might already know but have forgotten, sharpen your focus on some ideas what you can focus on and help you practice, and maybe give you some ideas where you can practice as well. So you probably won't learn like one key factor which will magically turn you into a brilliant speaker, but you might learn some nice things which help you improve, hopefully. Um, the three things I want to focus on is first of all finding the right issue, that's what we're talking about in the first lesson. The second point will be structuring speeches and how to impro improve yourself, maybe in interaction with others. And the third thing would be how to rebut classically like bad arguments and finding like when you're in stalemates with people who really don't want to get your point, how you can maybe advance your point, say by comparing different analysis, weighing arguments, acknowledging certain trade-offs that exist and how you can do that in nice speeches. Um, so before that, a little why is debating awesome? Um, I think it's awesome for you and generally for society it's cool. It's good for you because you learn to develop new points of view, like what happens in competitive debating or university debating is usually you get positions assigned, so you can't always choose what you defend. And that can be particularly nice, maybe the same class debate which you will have on the 26th, I think, with Kim, that you can focus on a new position you've never had before. Try to understand the arguments from that side. Maybe you'll be enlightened and think that's an awesome position. I think that's rather unlikely. What could happen is that you will understand the position a little bit better. So you can see that even people who disagree with you might have a lot more reason to it than we generally assume because we have this tendency of like thinking our positions are fairly sound and well argued, other positions aren't. Or if even that's not true, at least you can maybe see where the people come from. So if ever you want to argue against them, you have a maybe easier time finding those key arguments and those key positions and attacking them. Or maybe comforting them to a certain degree, agree on some general principles they agree with as well, and then improve. So I think that's cool about debating. Uh, it deepens your insight and sharpens your thinking. Because what you usually do is you give short speeches of seven minutes, maybe five minutes, three minutes. And you usually might have a vast amount of knowledge. Getting them into a short period of time is super difficult. Like even when you have practice, I continuously underestimate what you can say or overestimate what you can say in seven minutes or in five minutes or in three minutes. And that happens in any presentation you give and any like any point where you express yourself in public. So it's really, really good to get a grasp on it and see how to sharpen your thoughts, get them quick together, and bring up a logical analysis that goes by step by step so that people can actually follow you. And I think it's cool for society because debating as a concept means we acknowledge the fact that we disagree, we think that's totally okay to disagree, uh, and we just want to advance the best arguments possible. Meaning that we don't have a forced consensus where nobody is ever able to like, deny other people's opinions or where denying somebody else's opinion or disagreeing automatically means something negative, but it could just mean advancing a new position. And I think that's nice about debating because in ideal cases, you take the best arguments from both sides, try to pin them against each other and see which of the arguments still stand and which don't. And I think that's an interesting point to make, to see to not only stick with your position, but try to find the best arguments possible and maybe stay with your position, but say that from the seven arguments I thought undermine my position, two or three are only really good. Two or three are only very convincing if I think them through. And debating them with friends or in a public debate is really, really helpful in sharpening your thoughts. And it's really cool if you do it in a Loomis group or with friends because that means you find out in an environment where most people agree what works in an environment where most people might not agree with you. So you can take those arguments that actually work in practice and are convincing to some degree. So let's hope we can do that today. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is finding the right issues. Um, and there's something called in debating um, burden of proof. Um, I'm not going to write this because my handwriting is terrible. What I'm going to write is the idea behind burden of proof. Burden of proof, I would mean you see a question, a topic, any kind of discussion, and you want to figure out what do I need to show in order to convince other people? What do I need to tell them so that they can um, agree with my position? Say, 
Uh, I'm going to take some examples that might come up in your class later on. Uh, say you want that all university cafeterias should be vegetarian. There should be only vegetarian food in all university and school cafeterias. What should I need to prove to people in order to convince them that this works? Um, and I think there are usually three components. I mean, of course, every time, you break, every time you break stuff down, it's arbitrary, but I think those arbitrary criteria work somewhat well. Um, first off, what's the goal? Like, why do you want to do this? What do you want to achieve with it? And potentially, why is this a good goal? I guess, say, with vegetarian cafeterias, a goal could be um, that you think meat eating is really bad for the environment, potentially for your health, and you think reducing meat consumption would be a really good thing for a society overall. Um, second thing would be a mechanism. So, like... Even if we agree that the goal is right, you need to show why the one thing you want to propose, say a policy or something you want to enact, some general principle, actually leads to that goal. Which could be very, like that's very, very controversial in some debates. I guess um, maybe an environmental debate, say in humanitarian conflicts, that's a huge issue. Everybody agrees that armed conflict in Syria is really, really bad. What people really disagree on is whether intervention by the US or other states will improve the situation. So agreeing on goals, agreeing that we want to stop a civil conflict, doesn't mean that our policy that we propose, say an intervention in Syria, automatically leads to that goal. And that might be just as controversial in many cases as the goal itself. So you would need to figure out a mechanism of showing why whatever you propose actually leads to that goal. And the third thing would be and I heavily apologize for my handwriting, uh, alternatives, uh, which means even if the policy leads to that goal, why is it better than the alternatives that would exist? Like even if you manage to achieve what you want to achieve, would there be other ways to do it more efficiently, better? Maybe what we have right now, maybe doing nothing is already better. In environmental topics, I guess it's more often the question, maybe you can stop climate change a bit through carbon capture and storage, but is that really like the most efficient way of doing it or would there be other ways that change our structures more efficiently more sustainably. Um, so I guess those three keys are kind of your burden of proof that you should look into and ask yourself whenever you present any topic. What's the goal? How do you get to that goal? And is that really the best possible outcome we can have? Or maybe also like not the worst possible outcome we can have. Because in most scenarios, it's usually not that we compare really, really awesome things, but rather things that are somewhat bad, but some things are less bad than others. And we want to find out the thing that's less bad than other things. Same people might say, I don't know, building solar cells takes a lot of rare earth metals and also has a bad environmental impact if you want to create solar cells, so that's bad, but probably coal is a lot worse. And so what are credible alternatives and why is the least bad option sometimes the best option you can take? So again, um, taking those alternatives, acknowledging that some things are bad, but it's still better than the alternatives is usually a pretty good strategy um, to do. And we're going to try all of this later with a new motion. Um, what I'd like to focus on a little bit um, is the second point with mechanisms, um, which would be kind of the heart of an argument. So mechanisms would be um, to explain why do things work the way I want to, which would be maybe considered the classical argument. So it should ideally be rational, somewhat in a way formulated that people can follow up on it. I guess some part of it is scientific method, so you present your data, you present your information, so that people can follow up on those steps. I guess that would be debating in an academic context. Um, generally, what really helps in debating is the small question why. Like you have a, the uh, like a premise, some sort of general idea that you postulate, that this is something we want to achieve and this policy goes there. And you ask yourself why. Why will this lead to these outcomes? I don't know. Say meat consumption is bad for the environment. Why? Because it uses a lot more water and a lot of space than other agricultural production. Why is that bad? Those are limited resources we have on Earth. There's not like indispensable amounts of grazing land for cattle, so it's not a plausible alternative to do those things. Therefore, it's a bad option. Okay, so you got your first argument. Then the second argument you could look into, why should we do this in universities and cafeterias? You can say, okay, those are public institutes, therefore they're responsible. Why is that so? They're paid with taxpayers' money, they have a lot of young people which they shape for a long period, therefore we should do it. Why is that so? Because if you change young people's mindsets early on, they might develop more sustainable behaviors in the long run, which can then change environmental behavior and improve society. So kind of asking yourself, on most steps, why does it work and why does one step lead to the other until it gets 
like somewhat ridiculous, then it's probably a well-developed argument. And the question where you stop yourself is kind of the question of which audience you have in front of you. If you think they already agree on a lot of basic principles, if they already know the scientific backing of most things, you can maybe stop one step earlier. If you're in a public debate, public discussion, chances are people know less about it than the average Loomis student. So maybe then it's reasonable to go into a little more detail than the, you've assumed before. Um, so it's really good to go into this um, in detail and try to back, up, back it up with some examples or something that makes it illustrative. Um, I guess in academic debating what helps a lot is quoting scientific papers, quoting any statistic with numbers that are somewhat that people are somewhat able to grasp, probably not the most complicated with several decimals, but if you have easy to grasp number, easy to grasp statistics, they help you a lot. And if you have examples, they can be very illustrative for the point you're trying to make. Say you know a country where they introduced this policy and it worked pretty well, that's a very good example you can add in. Uh, what I'd like to consider in this um, would be something that doesn't really work well, in my opinion, is taking an example and generalizing it and saying that because this worked under this specific circumstances, it will work all of the time in those and those circumstances. So now I'm going to base my entire argument on the fact that this worked in some village in Africa when they made this project of how people live without, live without money, for example. That might not be always very, very convincing to people unless you can show why this is an example that works in all of those cases. So if, you, if you're going to use an example, I think it's very helpful to somehow illustrate why this example works in the case you want to apply it to. Because most of the things only work in specific contexts. So if you're able to show that an example is true in this specific context, it's very helpful. What it does more often is you give logical, plausible argument, you give some logical reasoning why it follows, and then illustrate it or underline it by showing exactly the way I explained it to you, exactly following this mechanism or similar to this mechanism, it worked in this case study, in this scientific paper. So therefore we think it's very plausible that it works this and this way. So I think examples are pretty good to illustrate things, but they're usually not something you should build it on. I think one key example for this is usually when we ask ourselves free market or the state. Like you will be able to create extremely nice narratives for what, and with 10 examples in how the state always screws up environmental policy or how the state always fails to enact good policies. But you will create you will also be able to create an equally convincing narrative in how the free market always fails to enact environmental policies if you simply cherry pick specific examples and you simply focus on the one things you want to focus on. So I think examples can be nice to illustrate, but ultimately what should work is A, scientifically sound data that's showing, yes, this can work in practice. Yes, this has been tested. Okay, everything all right. Um, and yes, it could work. Um, and on this point a bit um, of saying, can it work in practice? I think this would be one of the last takeaways on this issue I'd like to talk about, is to focus on if we have um, exactly those three points, say um, a goal, a mechanism, and the alternatives. When I say this as burden of proof, what we can focus on is that in some debates, we might agree on some of those issues already. And what then is very, very helpful for you is to think about either before the debate or during any speech, any conversation with people, where do we actually disagree? Where do we actually see the problem with each other? Because it might often be, as I talked about earlier, that we already agree or disagree on the goal. And then it might no longer be necessary to talk about it a lot. And I think that for some cases that's very obvious. Say we have a debate about climate change and we're going to discuss um, carbon storage systems. Then it might be very obvious that we agree on the goal of reducing CO2 emissions. That that's something we all already disagree, uh, agree upon. So nobody, when talking about carbon storage, would really, or few people in Europe, would question if you really need to reduce CO2 emissions. And the debate would mainly be about, does the mechanism actually work in the long run? Do alternatives exist? Um, so I think for us, that's obvious. For other topics, we feel that's a lot less obvious. Say you have a debate, should we reduce meat consumption? And you talk to the average citizen, then maybe already the goal of, is meat consumption really something harmful to an, our environment or not? Is that something really bad? Might already be controversial or not. A, that could be the case. If you feel that's the case, focus on the goals. I think more often than not what we see in our society is that people might already somewhat agree that yes, this is not really good for the environment and the debate only about the goals is not very helpful unless 
you focus instead on mechanisms on the terms of showing why maybe some simple lifestyle changes, say a meat-free Monday, any other form of reduction, might improve the situation. And people sometimes get stuck in this idea, we need to discuss about principles, I need to convince you that my principles are completely right, when sometimes you can see that maybe it's not that important to agree on the principle in full, maybe you don't need to convince someone that meat eating is always completely bad, and some, because maybe it also isn't. Um, and rather instead you can focus on some form of compromise, some form of mechanism of showing this is something that doesn't really harm you a lot, you could reduce your consumption once a week, twice a week, or just in any public building, and this is a mechanism that works. So sometimes when you feel there's disagreement on a point that cannot be resolved, instead of focusing over and over in, on it, which you see in online discussions or anywhere, um, try to move on to the next point where maybe some form of conclusion can be reached. Um, and I think Mm, that's pretty much the general idea, which we're going to test very, very soon. What you might have realized, what I've talked a bit about, was the idea um, that you might have different approaches depending on who you're talking to. Um, which, again, this sounds very, very obvious, and I think it is to some degree, but I think it's very, very good for you to repeat that to you whenever giving any public speech, any advanced course, any class. How much do people already know about the topic? Um, there's something in Aristotelian rhetorics which I'm not going to really go into because it's, I don't know, it's, it's nice, but you don't really know to be, uh, need to know all the fancy Greek words to get the point. Um, the point being that there's usually, again, arbitrary number of three things you can focus on. It's yourself, it's you, it's, oh, well, you in that sense is the person you're talking to or the audience, and the content of the speech. And in Aristotelian rhetorics, the ideal point would be um, to end up somewhere in the middle, meaning um, that with your speech, you're somewhat being true to yourself, true to the audience, and true to the content. Um, that might sound a bit fluffy. What that means is, for yourself as a person, I think it's usually very important to identify with the topic you're talking to. So you need to consider your relation so to the topic, to the content you're talking to. How much do you know? Usually the more you know about the topic, the more confident you are that what you're saying is true, actually has a meaning, the more convincing you will be. That's something that unfortunately all rhetorics can't help you. If you're not convinced, if you are very well aware that you have very limited knowledge of the topic, you will most of the time not sound very convincing. So reading up on things, reading some statistics, some scientific papers, automatically massively improves um, the way you feel. But also, how do you stand in relationship to that topic? Say you're in a group discussion and you have to, you're the speaker of your group, but you disagree with the decision the group has taken, which I guess can often be the case. That can be the case working for a corporation, an NGO, a political party, whatever you do. Um, one option would be to say, okay, I'm going to completely act out this policy now, I'm going to be an actor for that position and just completely ignore the way I, positionally, I personally stand to it. Um, I don't think that's the most genius strategy ever. What I'd recommend is always, if you have to defend a position that you don't fully agree with, try to figure out which parts of the position can I agree with? Which parts of the position do I think are reasonable? And then present it that way. You can say, as a group, we made this decision. We made it for these and these reasons. And you don't need to have the most passionate speech on why it's the most important or best decision ever if you're not convinced, because nobody's going to believe you most of the time anyway. What you can do is trying to find arguments that you can stand for and then be automatically a lot more reasonable about it. Say, um, finding the scientific data that is more or less objective that you can support, finding what has been the majority opinion of people when talking about it, why can this be seen as a reasonable opinion, and defend it that way. So if you have to defend something controversial, or something you disagree with, try to find some sort of common stance you have in between rather than extremely overacting and extremely trying to like, make up for your personal um, loss of identification with the topic, because I think usually it does not really work. Um, same goes for your relationship to the audience. What is the power structure you're facing? Are you a student who needs to convince somebody of a higher authority, of some higher local authority of, of something? That means you're probably on a lower status to some point, so you need to appeal convincing. You might use more statistics than usual. You might use more scientific data as usual. You might, I don't know, dress up to some point, again to a point where you personally still identify with it, to appeal convincing and appeal reasonable, because all those things automatically impact the way people look at you. Same goes when you talk to an audience, I don't know, of high school students. Autom you might dress down, you might use examples that are more understandable, you might use those points. And I think 
thinking about it beforehand, changing a PowerPoint slides, which sounds very logical to me, but is not really done by most people I know, be it from university or local authorities, to just have something that adapts to what your audience already knows, um, is in power relation to you, and maybe also wants to hear. I think it's very reasonable. So wh when I say what people want to hear, that doesn't mean you need to, or you should by any means, change your arguments completely, or like just cater to the audience to give them something they want to hear. I don't think that's the point. But what the point could be is, usually you have a number of arguments supporting your issue. You might have two or three different arguments where you propose something. And you know that some of those arguments are more important to one audience than to the other. And then it might be very, very reasonable to still name all of those arguments, but focus a lot more on this one specific one. Say um, it's a specific environmental policy um, and you talk to a, a corporation. You might focus on the profits this might lead, or you might focus on the corporate social responsibility that might be enacted. You talk to a local authority or a politician, you could talk about the jobs created through this policy. You talk to any local environmental NGO, you talk about the direct impacts on the environment in the specific areas. So all of those three aspects might be very important to you and to the group you're defending, but you can shift the balance, and you can shift the balance of arguments depending who you're talking to. And thinking about this beforehand, I think, is very, very important. And yeah, as I said, the context between you, you and content means how much does the audience know, how much can you go into scientific detail, what can you assume is previous knowledge and therefore skip in order not to bore them too much, and thereby finding some sort of common ground in between um, that makes people understand where you're trying to go to. Um, cool. Um, so what I'd like to do with you now, and we're running surprisingly good on time, is to practice this a little bit is to practice this a little bit, little bit. And we're going to do like a quick group around, I'd say maybe with five people in a group or four people in a group. So uh, you can try to sit in this and analyze the burden of proof and the target audience to try to go into, imagine you're part of a student group, a Lumen student group, and you want to convince people of the education authorities here in Skåne that only in schools and um, universities there should only be vegetarian food. So to use the example we've already talked about. Um, try to figure out what could be your burden of proof. So what's the goal, what's the mechanism, what would be the alternatives, and what's the audience knowledge level. If you go to a local authority, try to map it out a little bit in a group. I'd give you, say, we're running quite good in time, so around about five minutes to prepare, and then we go into a group discussion um, where we can discuss as a class ideas of how we can do it and, and just analyze the topic. So introducing a vegetarian, only vegetarian meals in university and school cafeterias and scones. Okay? So go ahead in groups. <laughs>